tonight on CBC Vancouver News. This is a shock to the institution and a shock to British Columbians. Sudden departures, secret investigations, favors for friends. Can order be restored in the house also? Sometimes when we order parcels for pickup, they just aren't getting picked up and they're not arriving to our customers in time. Local businesses scramble as Ottawa moves to force postal workers back on the job and... I thought it was pretty badass and so I came to check it out. Crowds gather in Vancouver's Chinatown as the Koi Killer strikes again. This is CBC Vancouver News. Good evening. More bombshell revelations at the B.C. Legislature. The House Speaker is now accused of trying to replace suspended Sergeant-at-Arms Gary Lenz with a longtime friend. Lenz and the Clerk of the House were suspended indefinitely pending a criminal investigation. As CBC's Tanya Fletcher explains, two special advisors have now been brought in by the Speaker. It all started when Liberal House Leader Mary Polak read aloud this sworn affidavit to the media. It relates to a meeting she and the other House leaders had on Monday with Speaker Daryl Plekis the day before Clerk Craig James and Sergeant at Arms Gary Lenz were suspended. During that meeting, Speaker Daryl Plekis stated his wish that Alan Mullen be appointed as Acting Sergeant at Arms of the Legislature after the departure of Gary Lenz from that position. She said such a move would be inappropriate, something later corroborated by NDP House Leader Mike Farnworth. That suggestion was made and uh, it was uh, a very firm no. Premier John Horgan said he had no idea the speaker in that meeting had requested his own friend and political aide take over the head security role here at the legislature. The first I, I heard of that was this morning and uh, when I talked to the House Leader about that he said that he didn't advise me of it because it was dismissed immediately. Plekis and Mullen are friends. They used to work together years ago at a maximum security prison in the Lower Mainland. In January, Plekis hired Mullen to look into concerns surrounding the clerk and the sergeant at arms. Well, late in the day, we heard from Speaker Daryl Plekis for the very first time since news broke of this criminal investigation. I'm sure you will find it interesting what I have to say this afternoon. Will you be making the statement yourself? I will be making a statement. Will you make yourself available to us later? Yes. But in the end, he never did. Instead, his special advisor came out and read this very brief prepared statement. I am confirming that the speaker has requested a second special advisor to advise on all things legal. The second special advisor is the Honorable Justice Wally Opal. Late in the day, motion was approved to have the deputy clerk and deputy sergeant at arms step into those roles temporarily. Now not only two special prosecutors, but two special advisors all the while still not knowing what the allegations are about. Perhaps the biggest irony of all is that the man who was initially the sole authority on providing official word about the scandal is now at the center of the scandal himself. Tanya Fletcher, CBC News, Victoria. And staying in Victoria, two men have been arrested after separate investigations into allegations of child exploitation. In the first case, police received information about a potential instance of internet child luring last summer. Investigators began monitoring the suspect's internet activity and then last week carried out a search warrant on his home. We use various techniques in order to uh, elicit from the uh, subject what their intentions are. And uh, um, it, there was no doubt in my mind in communicating with this person that he was looking to have sex with the mother and the child. Uh, and that this is something he desired. A 61-year-old Esquimalt man has been arrested. Police are recommending multiple charges, including luring a child under 14 years old, making child pornography, and distributing child pornography. In the second case, a 28-year-old man has been arrested after a covert investigation by police. He communicated uh, uh, with a... Uh, a, a youth uh, in order to uh, set up a, uh, a meet for sex uh, and this uh, person uh, actually uh, showed up at the meet uh, that occurred uh, in the Squamal uh, and uh, the individual was subsequently arrested. That suspect is facing one charge of luring a child under 16 years old. Police also believe he is staying in Canada illegally, and they are working with the CBSA to determine the next steps. 
A notorious B.C. gangster is out of prison and has been since June. We're only learning of it now because of what's being called a glitch. Our Dan Burrett is on the story for us tonight. Dan, who are we talking about? Anita, Mike, many viewers will know his name. Jared Bacon, well known as part of the infamous Bacon Brothers in the Fraser Valley. Now, Bacon was released from prison June 14th as part of a statutory release, but the Parole Board of Canada claims the public wasn't told until today because of a, quote, technical glitch. The board says it should not have happened, but won't say anything more. Bacon was serving time after being sentenced to 12 years in prison after he was convicted of conspiracy to smuggle cocaine in 2012. Now, the report says Bacon is considered a high risk to public safety. He's displayed an intention to settle scores, and he was involved in several violent assaults this year. The report also notes his history of drug use since he was a teenager and ongoing ties to organized crime. The board says it can only conclude he has ingrained criminal values. We don't know where Jared Bacon has been living since he was released because that's protected under our privacy laws. And Dan, this isn't the first time a mistake has been made on Bacon's prison file, is it? Indeed, Anita. To take a look at this timeline. As we mentioned, Bacon was sentenced to 12 years in prison in 2012. June 2018 was the earliest chance for his release. Since, by law, he must be released after serving two-thirds of his sentence. But he was accidentally released in February of last year because of a typo that caused a miscalculation in his actual sentence. Back then, he was ordered to live in a halfway house. Then, September 2017, parole was revoked after he was caught drinking in a strip club with a known criminal and giving police a false name. In February, he tried to use that mistake on his file to avoid going back to prison. It didn't work. And then in June, he was granted statutory release, and the public, as we said, not told until today because of that technical glitch. So for now, Bacon has to stay away from known criminals and drug users. He can't drink or use drugs himself, and he has to stay out of bars, among other things. Anita, Mike? Thanks very much, Dan. A former B.C. social worker who allegedly exploited several youth in his care is facing new accusations tonight. Three Aboriginal girls have filed lawsuits against Robert Riley Saunders, that brings the total number of legal action against Saunders to five. The suits allege Saunders used his position as a social worker to cut them off from family support and keep them from accessing their funding while in government care, and that his actions left them homeless and without food. The RCMP and the province's representative for children and youth are also investigating the claims. You can read more about this story on our website, cbc.ca slash bc. Well, it's been a busy first month in office for Surrey Mayor Doug McCallum. Between transit and policing, City Council has had its hands full. But where does affordability land on its list of priorities? Our John Hernandez went south of the Fraser today to find out. The towering high-rises pierce the sky in Surrey city centre, but for many who walk through this transit hub, the luxury condos here have come to symbolise a life they can't afford. It's pretty expensive. We are just earning and spending on rent. Housing in Surrey has gotten really bad, price-wise, the availability, everything. 30-year-old mom Cassie Skidmore lives with her husband and two kids. They pay $2,400 a month for a small four-bedroom home. They'd like to move, but can't quite afford it. My housing situation's nice, but it's expensive. You know, prices keep going up, but the job wages don't, jobs don't. Surrey does have an affordable housing strategy that was approved by the previous city council in April of this year. The goal there was to build more affordable market rental housing for people with low to moderate incomes. The only problem? That plan was done in alignment with the now defunct Surrey LRT project. The idea was to build more density around the light rail transit line. We're looking at a change in Surrey um, to where we want to encourage uh, more rental um, units. Mayor Doug McCallum says affordable living is a priority and he campaigned on densifying around new and current SkyTrain stations. But so far, City Council hasn't addressed those promises in any council meetings. City staff said they will eventually reassess the affordability plan, but so far the focus is on transit and policing. It's becoming impossible for people People to find a place to rent. But Dave Dewart says affordability shouldn't wait. He's part of a group of activists planning a rally criticizing Surrey's policing saga. They say the dollars needed to switch to a municipal force would be better spent on housing programs. So while spending gets shuffled off into policing or into uh, SkyTrain or wherever, 
The housing crisis continues to grow. A crisis that some residents can only withstand for so long. John Hernandez, CBC News, Surrey. Federal NDP leader Jagmeet Singh will get a chance this February to win a seat in Parliament. CBC News has confirmed the Liberal government will call three remaining by-elections in January and set the dates for the following month. One of those three contests will be in Burnaby South. That seat, of course, vacated by former NDP MP and now Mayor of Vancouver, Kennedy Stewart. Singh announced he would be the NDP's candidate in that riding last August. Both the Liberals and Conservatives say they intend to run a candidate against him. And the public health alert over romaine lettuce has not been extended to B.C., but that doesn't mean consumers here aren't feeling the impact. As the CBC's Rafferty Baker reports, some restaurants are erring on the side of caution and swapping out romaine for different leafy greens. Romaine lettuce finds its way into almost all of the salads at Vancouver's Field and Social, but not today. So swapping it out is a bit of an inconvenience. The restaurant supplier gets its romaine from California, and as of yesterday, it advised it wouldn't be sending more until the E. coli issue is figured out. We've been proactive about communicating it to customers, both on social media and in the store, and customers um, have been very understanding, but I think they were quite relieved that there's no romaine uh, here today. Nearby a chopped leaf, it's the same story. The supplier isn't shipping romaine and customers have to choose an alternative. The American Center for Disease Control reports 32 E. coli cases tied to romaine lettuce in 11 states. But it's recommending that nobody eat it across the country. In Canada, there are now 19 confirmed cases. The public health advisory is limited to Ontario, Quebec and now New Brunswick. There's no recall because it's still not clear where the source is. No one should be eating romaine that has come from the United States, period. Um, if you don't know where your romaine came from, throw it out anyway. Marler says there are probably many cases that arose in November, and there's a lag before the public health agencies finish their investigation and add them to the tally. I was contacted by a family from Vancouver who was visiting California, ate romaine, came home to Vancouver, and are now sick. They have been diagnosed with E. coli, 0157H7. That's the strain involved in the outbreak, but Marler says genetic testing still needs to be carried out to include his Vancouver clients in the official outbreak numbers. Unless you're growing your own romaine lettuce, Marler says you should do what salad restaurants are doing, take it out of your fridge and consider it compost. Rafferty Baker, CBC News, Vancouver. Well, the opening of a new grocery store wouldn't normally make a splash in most neighborhoods, but in Vancouver's historic Chinatown, it's a glimmer of hope for a community struggling with questions around its future and its identity. Leanne Young explains. From stocking boxes of pungent ginger to piling leafy gailan, Zi Gong may have never worked in retail before, but he's right at home because this is a homecoming for Zi. When he arrived in Canada more than 20 years ago, Chinatown was his first home. And two weeks ago, he and a partner opened this market at the corner of Gore and Kiefer Street. 20 years, I come here first, first, first year, I live here one year. Yeah, I'm from Chinatown, go out. So after 20 years, I, I try to come here again. Yeah, and I, I just try to some, do our best yeah. service Chinatown, yeah. Doing his best to service Chinatown, he says, by opening a traditional produce store and giving everyone, especially local seniors, a place they're comfortable in. Z knows it's unexpected to invest in this neighborhood. A quick drive down the street and you can't miss the shuttered doors one after the other. I know right now Chinatown, many young people just move out. Only maybe already senior people live there, yeah, around there, yeah. yeah. So we try something different, yeah, I try, I try yeah. His new venture is different. It's a far cry from the trendier businesses that have sprung up in recent years. Z tells me while he's happy to see Western and non-traditional businesses opening up here in his neighborhood, he'd also like to see local governments do more to protect the historic and cultural heritage of Chinatown. Since 2009, we lost 50% of what we deem like fresh 
culturally appropriate food assets. So that means green grocers, fishmongers, barbecue sh meat shops. Uh, and that's quite concerning for a lot of the Chinese seniors who might have ac access issues, as well as uh, people have the right to eat the type of foods they, they brings them a sense of home, brings them a sense of comfort. Businesses such as Chen Sun coming opening up in Chinatown uh, and serving culture appropriate food, I think it's very meaningful for the neighborhood. Advocates in the area have been pushing for civic policies to protect the community. Part of that demand was met with the city and province's recent pledge to apply to make Chinatown a UNESCO designated heritage site. But just the goal of submitting an application is years away. Until then, businesses like these are a glimmer of hope for a revitalized future. Leanne Young, CBC News, Vancouver. And that river otter that's been eating koi at a popular Chinese garden in Vancouver is still on the loose tonight. Mm -hmm. Vancouver Park Board set up traps to try to catch the critter, but as the CBC's Tina Lovegreen reports tonight, the otter continues to feast on colorful fish. The otter has struck again. Another gutted koi carcass discovered today at the Dr. Sun Yat-sen Classical Chinese Garden. Staff quickly moved in to clear away the evidence. The tally now, seven dead fish and one elusive carnivore. The park remains closed to visitors and the media because of the ongoing attempt to catch the culprit. Apparently overnight, the otter crept into one of the traps, stole the bait and slipped away. Oh, well, maybe he'll, he'll come out later. The wildlife battle is getting a lot of attention. Dozens of people peered through the gates of the gardens, trying to catch a glimpse of the evasive otter. Oh, I want to see if they caught it. Well, I'm here because I've read about this otter eating the koi fishes here in the pond. I thought it was pretty badass, and so I came to check it out. Ideally, I'd like to see him, like, burst through the water, flop through the air, and smash down, free willy style. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but beyond the cat and mouse game, why are people so intrigued by this story? Well, cute things give us that warm, fuzzy feeling, and, and in this case, it's an emotional response in the brain. So if the otter is perceived as being cute, you've, you've got that, that warm, fuzzy feeling, which is just a natural neural response that you have. The second piece is, is a bit more involved. Basically, one of the things that our brain likes to do is figure out whether anything that's happening is something that it's expecting to happen or not. And in this case, this is something unusual. And, and when unusual things happen, that, that, tr that triggers a brain response that, that captures our attention. Not everyone is getting such a fuzzy feeling, like nine-year-old RJ4. Makes me feel sad because I have koi fish at home. Yeah. So I, let, so I love koi fish. They're my favorite type of fish. For now, staff have rebaited the traps, hoping tonight is the night this all ends. Tina Lovegreen, CBC News, Vancouver. Hmm. And we do have a little bit of an update. Yep. Uh, the park board is enlisting a wildlife relocation expert to help catch the otter. Yeah. Uh, the otter has quite the fan club. I mean, except for the koi. They're not part They're of not it. They're not big fans. Not big fans, <laughs> yeah. So uh, the, originally, they were going to try to re relocate it, I think, to Stanley Park. Mm -hmm. And now they're saying uh, the Fraser Valley. But you got to catch it first. Yeah. It's proving very elusive. Let's see what happens oh, tomorrow. Yes. We will have an update for you. Let's go to Amy Bell now, who is here with a first look at the weather. Amy? It's wet. It's a good weather for a koi fish, that's for sure. Yeah, it's been a bit of a uh, stormy day. We had earlier wind warnings up for Vancouver Island. They've come down, but we're still going to see some gusty winds, and we're definitely going to see the rain uh, picking back up overnight. What we are going to see over the next couple of days is heavy rain at times, especially as I mentioned tonight, and then we'll sort of see things settling down between systems uh, Friday afternoon into Saturday morning, but then we do ramp back up again on Sunday. So we're not really going to get away from the rain. We do have snowfall warnings for the uh, Fraser Canyon and the Nicola Valley. So if you're doing any traveling tonight and tomorrow, uh, just south of the summit on the Coquihalla, they're expecting 20 to 30 centimeters by tomorrow night. And then this system will move further east. But we are definitely going to see very winter storm like conditions for many areas in the interior. So do keep that in mind if you're doing any traveling. We will see a bit of snow as well for the local mountains, getting snow on Whistler and for some of the local mountains overnight. But for us, it's just going to be wet for the next few days. Okay, Amy, thanks very much. Talk to you in a little bit. And you just a reminder, you can also watch CBC Vancouver News at 6 on our website, cbc.ca slash bc. And if you're watching us right now on Facebook or YouTube, instead of commercials, you're going to see more of us in the first half hour.
And we want to use that time to talk to you. Tomorrow we'll be doing another Q&A with the viewers. So tweet at CBC News BC with your questions or send them to Mike and me directly on Twitter. Absolutely. Well, the pipeline isn't built and there's been a lot of suggestion the federal purchase of Trans Mountain was a mistake. But it's made money for the feds quite a lot. Just how much after the break? Good evening and hello to those of you who are watching on Facebook and YouTube tonight. Well, this is uh, sort of new to us, I guess newer to Mike. I've done a few of them. Yes. <laughs> um, some of you loyal viewers may remember that we did live stream the show earlier this year. Dan was very good with uh, getting back to you in the comments. Yeah. Well, we are back now for good. Uh, so we do have a small favor to ask of you. Let your friends know that we are back online. So if you're not at home at 6 o'clock, you can log on to Facebook or YouTube. Absolutely. And we're well aware that more and more people are quitting cable. So if you can help us get the word out about the live stream, that would be greatly appreciated. We're looking forward to doing that live Q&A with you during tomorrow's live stream break. So do send us in your questions now. And you can post them in the Facebook comment section or you can, again, tweet us. Our handles are uh, on the screen or, yeah, they are on the screen right there. Uh, for tonight's break, though, we are taking you to the Vancouver Aquarium. They've got a pretty special holiday exhibit right now. Um, it starts tomorrow, but we got to get a little sneak peek today. Take a look. When visitors first enter the building, they'll be greeted by a really cool sight. Two electric eels are swimming around in the display behind us. These animals harness the power of electricity to stun their prey. And at daily feed programs at 11.30 this holiday season, the electric eels will also be using their power to light up a festive Christmas tree. I hope the visitors will get a chance to enjoy daily scuba claws dives running through December 24 as he makes appearance in some of our most famous exhibits. Since a trip to the aquarium includes a visit to tropical saltwater environments, we've transformed one of our most famous jellyfish habitats into a living snow globe. I think that this will be a great photo opportunity for our visitors and an excellent travel memento from any out-of-town guests' time in Vancouver. Very nice. Mm -hmm. Love scuba claws. Kids, kids love scuba claws, too. never seen them in person. Oh, yeah. Lots of fun. Lots of fun. <laughs> when was the last time you've been to the aquarium? Uh, it's been a while. There was a nice event there, I think it was last year. Okay. A reception y thing amidst the fish and a, everything. A fancy. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Isn't that fancy? I, it's, been, it's been a long time since I've been yeah. there. <laughs> that exhibit runs until January 6th, so lots of time for you to check it out or maybe mm -hmm. uh, for myself to check it out. You should. Yes. You should, for sure. And uh, just a reminder to subscribe to our YouTube channel. We are only streaming the first half of the show on Facebook, so if you do want to watch the whole thing, you have to watch on YouTube. And we're going to post a link to that uh, on the Facebook section. So we'll look forward to answering your questions tomorrow. If you sent one in already, be sure to tune in. Back with the news in just a few moments. Well, with contract negotiations at a standstill, the federal government has tabled back-to-work legislation for Canada Post carriers. The motion to fast-track the bill means delivery of backlogged mail could start in the coming days. As the CBC's Katie Simpson reports, for many small businesses, the news couldn't come soon enough. So this is uh, puddings, Christmas puddings. These presents may just make it under the Christmas tree after all. As the owner of two specialty shops, Michael Cox uses Canada Post to ship products to his customers and welcomes today's step toward passing back-to-work legislation. Christmas can always be saved if people want to save it. The Liberals have now started a process to fast-track a bill which, if passed, could force mail carriers to return to the job in a matter of days. It comes after five weeks of rotating strikes and little progress at the negotiating table. The two parties continue to negotiate with a mediator, but having said that, we need to be ready to act if they can't reach an agreement. 
The move triggered even more frustration on the picket line. I know that the public generally feels that at this point we're probably ruining Christmas. Uh, that's not the case at all. Forcing us back, yeah, we're just going back to the same horrible working conditions in the busiest time of year. We're going to be overburdened. There's going to be injuries. Negotiators can't find common ground on working conditions, safety protections, and wages. The union's president says he is outraged, but not surprised. Canada Post only has one game. It's to sit back and wait for legislation. And now the government is doing their dirty work. Canada Post employees have been legislated back to work before, in 2011 under the Conservatives and in 1997 under the Liberals. It's a risky move that can lead to resentment on all sides, according to this professor. Over the longer term, if you continue to resolve your disputes through the use of arbitrators, avoid making some of the oh, tendency to avoid making some of the tough decisions. Even if back to work legislation is brought in within days, the Postal Workers Union isn't ruling out any options when it comes to their response, including new possible work to rule actions. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Ottawa. Now to Calgary, where the Prime Minister met with oil industry leaders today. Justin Trudeau says the Liberal government's fiscal plan, which was announced yesterday, will stimulate business in Alberta. But he was met by a group of angry protesters who say their province has been abandoned in the midst of a crisis. The CBC's Aaron Collins reports. Angry and ignored, the feeling among the 2,000 protesters here, almost palpable. Frustrated by the enormous discount Alberta crude is being sold for, about $40 per barrel less than the U.S. benchmark price these days. It's a huge economic crisis for Canada, for Alberta, for every Canadian. They should be concerned about the fact that oil and gas producers are not making any money. The reason for that crisis and this protest, an inability to get Canadian oil to market due to a lack of pipeline capacity. And rightly or wrongly, in this crowd, much of the blame for that lies with Justin Trudeau, in town today to speak about that very problem. Because we're forced to sell our oil at a discount, Canada's economy is losing an estimated $80 million a day. That's unacceptable. But no concrete solutions on offer in this speech or in this week's fiscal update. Even industry isn't entirely united on the best ways to move forward on how to fix this differential. Well, the Prime Minister did meet with industry heavyweights today, some of whom have been calling for mandated reductions in oil production. The hope being that decreasing the production of oil here will bring prices for Canadian crude back up. Another option being proposed, increasing oil by rail until a new pipeline is built, something Alberta has asked the federal government to pay for, a plan the province's premier was disappointed to see left out of the federal fiscal update. If there was this kind of economic crisis going on in the manufacturing sector in Ontario, we're pretty sure it would make its way into the first two paragraphs of the fiscal update. Unresolved, it's an economic crisis that could cost Alberta's Treasury as much as $4 billion in 2019. A political crisis for a government facing an election in the spring and an increasingly hostile electorate. Aaron Collins, CBC News, Calgary. Meantime, Trudeau said today he's hopeful construction on the Trans Mountain Pipeline will resume next spring, but he was unable to provide a clear timeline, saying it all depends on when the renewed consultation process wraps up. Ottawa, of course, bought the Trans Mountain Pipeline for $4.5 billion this summer. Construction has been slowed by a federal court ruling that suggested more meaningful consultation with Indigenous communities was needed. The government is doing that now, but according to the fiscal update, it has made $70 million on the investment already, and on an annualized basis, that would be about $200 million. <laughs> Well, one of our region's first responders is being honored for his contributions outside the line of duty. Justin Mulcahy has been named Vancouver's Firefighter of the Year for his role in the Snacks for Kids program. Established five years ago, the entirely volunteer program provides meals for more than 2,000 students in East Vancouver. Anita spoke with him earlier today about why the charity is close to his heart. 
Well, not being said, you helped start the Snacks for Kids program. Um, tell me a little bit about that and let's look at, at what you guys are providing for students. Sure, sounds good. Yeah, so our program offers daily nutritional support to 2,000 inner, inner city kids in Vancouver schools. We're in about 40 schools and we provide kind of uh, snack options for kids uh, to make sure that they're fed and nourished in a school day. So I can show you the uh, stop and yeah, shop container look. if you want. With our program, we offer kind of like snack supplements to get them through the day. It's it's sort of our it's our idea that you know when kids go to school, uh, they should be fed and nourished. And so, uh, with the types of foods we offer, we try and have densely nutritious foods, uh, things that kids firstly will consume, uh, that will give them the calories and food they need to do the day-to-day -day things. One of the reasons why we focus on uh, education-based programs is that uh, you know school and the access to an education is something it's one of the ladders that allows kids to climb out of really uh, tragic situations and or or at least challenging situations and uh, you know food insecurity is a barrier to accessing your education so we're focused on a program on making sure, sure kids are fed during the day and that being said have you heard from the families or the kids themselves uh, uh, people who've taken part in this program yeah so um, every every year I receive like cartons and cartons of thank you cards and, and stuff from our partner schools, uh, both from the teachers as well as from the students. Uh, I hear from first line uh, Vancouver School Board staff uh, that about the impact it makes in their classrooms. And that must yeah. feel good. Yeah, it's great, yeah. Uh, I have two young kids myself, so I know how important nutrition is uh, for them, uh, what they're like uh, when they're hungry and angry, and, and uh, so uh, I know firsthand what this is all about. Okay. Snacks for Kids started off helping about 150 students now more than 2,000 where do you hope the program will go in the future yeah you know in a, in a perfect world there'd be no need for a program like ours uh, what I would like to see with our program is to continue to engage the community uh, in the sense that you know since we fund this through payroll donations uh, how we've been incredibly successful how we've got to where we are now is through the community support that we received uh, so people getting behind this program has really allowed us to kind of meet the need in the community uh, where I'd like to go is to just continue what we're doing and, and uh, do the best we can for the kids in their schools. Well, thank you for all that you do and congratulations on being Firefighter of the Year. Thanks very much. Thanks for having me today. Small businesses in Vancouver relying on Canada Post say the strike is hurting their bottom line. We'll speak with one company struggling to keep up.
Thanks for joining us tonight. Here are some of our top stories. The public are entitled to the truth about the events of this week. We are here to disclose what we know about these events rather than to come to conclusions or to speculate about what might have led to these events. The drama at the B.C. Legislature just keeps unfolding. We're now learning the Speaker of the House wanted to temporarily replace the now suspended Sergeant at Arms with his special advisor. That person also happens to be a longtime friend. What brings you here, sir? Checking out the otter. Really? Yeah. Uh, it makes me feel sad because I have koi fish at home. It's kind of bizarre to have like an otter just kicking around eating all the koi and whatnot. In the city? <laughs> Crowds gather in Chinatown to try to get a glimpse of a crafty critter who's left behind evidence of his deadly latest attack, the river otter that's been eating all of the koi at the Dr. Sun Yet Sun Classical Chinese Garden has gutted yet another fish. He's still on the loose, and the park remains closed to visitors. And Canada Post carriers are accusing the federal government of violating their constitutional rights. The feds have pushed emergency legislation forcing employees back to work the strike is in its fifth week, with no sign yet of a breakthrough in contract negotiations. And the rotating strikes have caused problems for small businesses right across the country, including right here in Metro Vancouver. Farouk Babul, co-owner of the Vancouver Candle Company, joins us now. Farouk, thanks very much for being with us. Uh, we can see a lot of uh, packages and boxes me. on the shelves and behind you. Uh, are you saying the, the, these rotating strikes have resulted in a significant backlog for your company? Uh, definitely. I think the biggest issue with us is just having certainty. Like um, sometimes when we order parcels for pickup, they just aren't getting picked up and they're not arriving to our customers in time. Right. So how are your customers responding to that? Um, I mean, negatively, I mean, in the world of Amazon and other e-com, um, customers expect their parcels to be delivered as soon as possible. And we try our best to get them out as quick as possible so that they arrive next business day or the day after. But unless they're being picked up by Canada Post, uh, we, we kind of do have to look for suitable alternative ways of getting them out their parcels. And uh, you say you've got a significant backlog. Can you quantify that? I mean, how, how, many, how many packages and parcels are just sitting there uh, yeah. waiting to go out? We process between 20 and 30 parcels a day. So I know uh, we filled up our car with three, three or four different trips yesterday and dropped them off to the Canada Post outlet next to our house. Um, but once they get to the Canada Post outlet, we can't control how quickly and how, and how quickly they're being shipped from there on. Um, so we do get emails um, and, and telephone calls from our customers um, asking the status of their parcels. So are, are you exploring other alternatives uh, to, to try to get things to where yeah, they we, have to go? Yeah, we are exploring other alternatives. Um, in Canada, at least, there is, there is a few others. Uh, we do find Canada Post to be the most economical ways of shipping parcels. Um, so we are exploring others like during the strike, uh, but we will be going back to Canada Post once things resume. Right, but in the meantime, I guess if you have to go to these uh, alternate methods, that could affect uh, your company's bottom line. Oh, it definitely does. And we saw today that the, uh, the federal government is pushing ahead with back-to-work uh, legislation. Is, is that something you would uh, support as a business affected by these rotating strikes? Definitely. I think for, as a small business, especially one that, that operates out of uh, Vancouver, we're just looking for certainty. Uh, we're looking for our parcels to get picked up quickly and get delivered uh, cost-effectively and efficiently. All right, Farouk, we appreciate your uh, time uh, this afternoon. We uh, look forward to uh, having you get those packages to where they, uh, where they have to go eventually and somehow. Appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Rain hitting our cameras looking out over downtown Vancouver, but the white stuff is in the forecast for mountain passes tonight. Amy Bell will tell you how much and for how long after the break.
to hand us off tonight. Amy Bell is here. I uh, reluctantly went outside this afternoon. <laughs> yes. It was a mistake. Did you have your umbrella? I didn't. Oh, well, you've got that. plenty of time to find it. Yeah, that's what I need to do. <laughs> no sure. rain hair, so you're okay. Uh, sir, but the hair survived. Yeah. Good. Survived. That's what's important. Yeah, it's a, it's a bit of a wet one today, uh -huh. and we're actually seeing snow in some areas, and we will get a bit of snow for the local mountains. But for most of us, we're just going to see things wet, and it was wet all day. We'll take a look at the time lapse. You can see for yourself. It was a dark and stormy start to the day for sure. Uh, we saw intense rain early in the day, and then it did actually lighten up for a while in the afternoon, and then we saw this second round moving in. So certainly, uh, yes, it has been a wet one, and we will continue to see that. See, we did have some breaks in the afternoon. Uh, we do, or we did have wind warnings up on Vancouver Island earlier this afternoon. That has passed as the system has sort of moved on and lost a lot of its power, but we do have more exciting weather heading our way. Right now, we do have snowfall warnings, in fact, for uh, the Fraser Canyon and Nicola. So if you're heading up on the uh, Coquihalla, especially 20 to 30, minute, uh, 30 centimeters of snow expected to fall overnight and in throughout the day tomorrow. It'll be tomorrow evening that that system finally pushes further east, but that is a lot of snow to fall and fairly short short period of time so make sure you're prepared for that and we will as you can see see that snowfall in many areas of the interior but the good news is once we get through the overnight rain and some snow it really clears up for good spells so Saturday starts off clear but you can see that system packs a lot of precipitation and that of course will once again bring a lot of snowfall to areas of the interior in the northern half of the province it'll still translate as rain though across the north central coast and here for us on the south coast however we are seeing snow for the uh, Whistler Mountain today and we will see that snow level coming down to about 800 meters so that's a good chance to get some snow for some of our North Shore mountains as well which is desperately needed for that snowpack so we'll keep an eye on things uh, I'll take a look at the snow forecast you can see though it really does come down quite a bit lower so we'll see that snow if you're heading up to Whistler past Squamish and then as you make your way from Hope to Merritt that's when you're really going to start to see that snow falling for many areas though we are looking at rain so uh, we've got rain for Victoria Nanaimo and Comox to Phoenix you'll get behind that system early on and you'll see some sunshine but yes a mix of rain and snow for Whistler Village snow just light flurries in fact for Williams Lake and Cranbrook tomorrow and you even see a few sunny breaks for Kelowna for Prince Rupert we're looking at a few showers and very chilly and snow for Dees Lake and a high of minus six and then with the wind chill it will feel a little bit cooler so uh, do keep that in mind we'll take a look at the five-day forecast and for us what we're seeing of course is rain and there's not much we can do about that so so uh, we'll catch a little bit of a break tomorrow afternoon and in through Saturday. I don't want to make promises, but we could see a few little breaks of blue sky, maybe a hint of sunshine. Uh, and then that next system really arrives Sunday afternoon and into the evening. So, yeah, it's not a total washout for the weekend. That's all right. And I'm keeping an eye out for that hint of sunshine. <laughs> <laughs> or head up to Whistler. It's going to be yeah, great. They had a partial yeah. opening today. They up did, there. yeah. So it'll be a good weekend up there for everybody. Very good. All right. Thanks, Amy. You're welcome. Days after vowing he had the confidence of the St. Michael's board, the principal of that school has resigned following the sex scandal at a Toronto high school. Why he's gone after the break.
Hi, I'm Amy Bell, and here's what's in your CBC Vancouver inbox. Clear your calendar for December 7th. It's CBC Radio Canada's 32nd Annual Open House and Food Bank Day. Join me and other CBC personalities at 700 Hamilton Street for live broadcasts, musical performances, and tours of the newsroom. Last year, we raised almost $800,000 for food banks across BC. For more from CBC Vancouver, check us out online. A man convicted of attempting to kill his ex-wife and two Winnipeg lawyers with bombs sent in the mail has been sentenced to life in prison. In her decision, the judge said Guido Amsel is not remorseful and has not taken responsibility for his actions. CBC's Caroline Barga reports. Guido Amsel walked into court escorted by corrections officers. His hands and feet were shackled. He wore a navy suit, white shirt and red tie. And he didn't say anything during the hour-long sentencing hearing, even after learning he wouldn't be eligible to apply for parole for 17 years. In May, Amsel was convicted of four counts of attempted murder and a slew of other charges. Five years ago, he planted a bomb in his ex-wife's car. It blew up, but no one was injured. In 2015, he sent bombs in the mail to his ex-wife and two Winnipeg lawyers. Maria Matusis lost her right hand and was seriously injured after a homemade device planted in an audio recorder exploded in her office. She was in court to hear Provincial Court Judge Tracy Lord deliver her sentence. Mr. Amsel's plan was extremely calculated and as in the Rogers case was executed with cold deliberation. He showed not only a callous and vengeful intent toward the specific targets of the devices but also an indiscriminate disregard for the lives and safety of others in the community. As such, he bears a high degree of moral responsibility for his actions. Judge Lord sentenced Amsel to 12 and a half years for the first attempt on his ex-wife's life. Taking into account the three and a half years he's already served, it works out to seven more years in prison without the possibility of parole. After that, Amsel will begin serving a life sentence for the 2015 attempted murders, and he won't be eligible for parole for 10 more years. Amsel's loved ones were in court. Afterwards, they told reporters they still believe he's innocent. Amsel's wife says she'd like to hire a lawyer from B.C. to appeal the convictions, but doesn't think the family can afford it. Caroline Bargood, CBC News, Winnipeg. The principal and president of St. Michael's Boys School in Toronto have resigned. It comes just days after the Catholic school became the focus of sex assault allegations. The board of directors says Principal Greg Reeves and President Father Jefferson Thompson have stepped down so the school can move forward without distractions. Officials have been criticized for waiting to report the alleged incidents to police. Sex assault charges have been laid against six boys in the case. Russia's controversial military intelligence chief is dead. According to Russian news reports, he died after a lengthy illness. But the agency he headed, the GRU, has recently been linked to a number of embarrassing revelations, including the poisoning of former double agent Sergei Skripal in England. CBC's Chris Brown is in Moscow with more. The announcement of the death of GRU Chief Igor Korobov came in the middle of the night with the most basic of statements read on Russian state TV. It was a result of a long and serious illness, said the announcer, and that may well be the case. Korobov, who's seen here on the right along with Russian Defense Minister Sergei Shoigu, was 62 years old and a highly decorated military officer. He'd also been given the Hero of Russia Award. When President Vladimir Putin attended a public ceremony for the GRU marking the Military Intelligence Service's 100th anniversary, notably Igor Korbov was not present. Then again, there had also been unconfirmed stories in the Russian media that Putin was displeased because so many of the supposedly secret services secrets had been publicly exposed or at least discussed. The two men accused of flying to England to murder the Skripals in Salisbury with nerve agent were unmasked as a likely GRU colonel and also a GRU medical doctor. While the Skripal survived, another British woman was killed and the ensuing media investigation shone a very unwelcome light on the inner workings of the GRU. Independent Russian media outlets obtained databases from the Russian government and then went on to publish long lists of vehicles 
vehicles that were purportedly driven by GRU officers, and then they published lists of possible GRU operatives working all across Europe in what would stand to be a mammoth security failure. Various Russian officials today are praising Korobov's career as a head of GRU, but clearly the position has taken a toll on those who've served in it. Two years ago, Korobov's predecessor, who was also very young, just 59 years old, he also died, apparently, of a heart attack. Chris Brown, CBC News, Moscow. Canada's official florist, but Marketplace has heard from dozens of Canadians with complaints about failed flower deliveries. So it put Bluemex's fast, fresh, and fair service motto to the test. Charles the Agro reports. This one with the daisies. When Pat Hodnett lost her sister-in-law, she wanted to send funeral flowers that meant something. Betty was a gardener, mm. and she loved English gardens. And she loved happy, cheerful flowers. And so the flowers that I picked, I thought, I thought of her. They were daisies and just so cheerful. Hodnett found Bluemax almost instantly online. She paid $73 to send Voyage of the Doves to the funeral home. Very pretty, mm -hmm. very pretty. When she arrived at the service, she searched through the bouquets. I didn't see them there. When I got to the end, there was a little vase. Um, it had a handful of... Uh, little carnations and some greenery. And I looked at the card and it was for me. And it was, it was pathetic. I was so embarrassed to tell you the truth and I just wanted to hide it. Hodnett is one of hundreds of consumers across the country who have complained about Bluemax, claiming they received cheap substitutions to no delivery at all. Marketplace put Bluemax to the test, ordering five bouquets and had them delivered to addresses near Toronto. I know that they're not fresh because we can see how the chrysanthemums are wilted and bloomed. Right. And again, if we're looking at the greenery as it comes in into your home, so again, it, dis it discolors the water, it looks slimy, yeah, this and it's is a mess. We show Dan Waltho, president of the Canadian Institute of Floral Design, what we bought, and he compared it to what we actually got. Well, overall, it's poor quality, and, and I, I'm ashamed of people in my industry sending this kind of material out to consumers. It's, it taints our industry. After complaining, Hodnett got her money back. It's false advertising. Terrible. Just terrible. Awful way to run a business. Bluemax declined our request for an on-camera interview. We shared photos and general delivery locations, but the company said it needed more details to do an on-camera interview. Bluemax did tell Marketplace flowers are perishable and they make every effort to deliver their products in good condition. If you're unhappy, Bluemax says send them a picture and they'll send you a credit or a refund. Charles Diagro, CBC News, Toronto. Well, it's Christmas at the Vancouver Aquarium. I'm going to show you the festivities, including more of this scuba diving Santa right after the break.
Friday on the early edition, female chefs around the world are trying to change the culture of male-dominated kitchens. We'll hear about the new film, The Heat, A Kitchen Revolution. That's tomorrow morning, beginning at 5 a.m. on the early edition. Well, before we go tonight, we want to take you to the Vancouver Aquarium. They've got some special holiday-themed exhibits for you starting tomorrow, but of course, CBC got a little sneak peek. Take a look. When visitors first enter the building, they'll be greeted by a really cool sight. Two electric eels are swimming around in the display behind us. These animals harness the power of electricity to stun their prey. And at daily feed programs at 11.30 this holiday season, the electric eels will also be using their power to light up a festive Christmas tree. I hope the visitors will get a chance to enjoy daily scuba claws dives running through December 24 as he makes appearance in some of our most famous exhibits. Since a trip to the aquarium includes a visit to tropical saltwater environments, we've transformed one of our most famous jellyfish habitats into a living snow globe. I think that this will be a great photo opportunity for our visitors and an excellent travel memento from any out-of-town guests' time in Vancouver. Yeah. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, always fun, right? Yeah. I've never actually seen scuba claws in person. I have. Uh, water is probably, it's probably warmer there underwater than it is up at the North Pole, so I'm sure Santa's enjoying it. It's a nice little break. Absolutely. <laughs> no, but it is funny. You've got the electric eels, you got all that stuff. Kids love it. Yeah, I actually yeah. really liked the jellyfish snow globe. Yeah, good addition. You can always find our news program online at cbc.ca slash bc. Our next local newscast is right here after the National with the one and only... Dan Burrett. Have a good night. Have a good night.